Hello, welcome to Rational Investing. My name is Cameron Stewart, CFA. Thank you very much for watching the channel, all the subscribers and comments. I greatly appreciate it. This channel is dedicated to the rational value-based cash flow investor. We look for five key attributes for all investments. That's going to be top line revenue growth, EBITDA growth, strong free cash flow, low debt, and a well-priced stock. Those are our five key attributes that we use to review every stock. This stock behind me is AppN Limited, an Australian company that trades on the Australian Stock Exchange and here in the pink sheets in the United States. They are a fascinating company that deals with the AI market. We're going to go through, come up with what we think the intrinsic value of this business is. We'll then see what it's trading at. And if there's a gap there, that gap is our economic return that we will realize overholding it many, many years. Now, this is their annual 10K. Uh, and their annual report. It's filed as of December, their fiscal year, December 2019. There'll be a new one that's going to come out on February 24th. They will release their 2020 version. But right now we have the 2019 and we're going to go with that. Let's figure out what we think this business is worth and what we think we can make by holding the stock. Then we're going to start by reviewing the 10K. Please download it, read it. It was a brilliant read. I'm going to start here with what they do on page three. Uh, what they do, and I'll read this for you, uh, we collect, classify, translate, review, and label large volumes of image, text, speech, audio, and video data that we use to build and improve AI systems and machine learning. What does that mean? Well, if you build an AI machine, you have to feed that machine data. These guys own, store, and classify the data that you feed the AI machine to learn. It's a, they are a service provider to the AI industry, and I think it's a really interesting business model, and I enjoyed reading this 10K, and I highly suggest you go get it yourself and read it. A little bit more about them. So how they run their business is, is, is shown on this slide right here. They have over a million outsourced service providers, contractors, that they use that'll put in two, four, five hours a day as kind of a side gig reviewing and labeling the image, the text, the data that app and feeds these contractors. So what does an average day look like? It's so an average day a person will sit in front of a screen and app and will show them one image of a road as an example. And this person will physically draw out and label the tree, the other cars, the curb, the sidewalk, pedestrians, signage, so that in that video frame, the computer will know Every outline means a particular object. And they do that across hundreds of millions of images across the world. And this data set is then fed into LiDAR programs, as an example. So the LiDAR knows what a bus looks like, what a tree looks like. And it's constantly being updated to keep it as fresh as possible. That's what they do. And they do it in 130 uh, countries. They do it in 180 different languages. And I thought, languages, what is that? Uh, well, the example there would be an audio system that you call into if you're calling into your bank and you're talking to that AI. Maybe you have a different accent within the country that you're in, or you're speaking a different language. All of this needs to be translated and reviewed and updated constantly because language is always evolving. And that's their service model. They've been doing it for 20 years. There are nine offices around the globe. Pretty interesting. And what I liked about this is if I'm Google or Apple or an AI builder, I am not going to stand up an entire team that, that, that's going to classify the data I feed into the machine. I'm going to focus my capital on building new AI machines to satisfy markets. And I'll outsource the data quality collection and labeling to a service provider. And so I think this business model is very defensible uh, hopefully, these guys remain one of the leaders. There's always room for other competition. But in terms of the service, I don't see someone like a Google or so forth trying to get this business. They would much rather go build another AI bot than try to do this business. So uh, I kind of liked what I was saying, and I continued to read. Uh, the next thing I wanted to show you was just some of the recent growth that they're, that they're experiencing. Uh, revenue, Australian dollars here, by the way. So 82 uh, million dollars up to uh, 536 million dollars Australian. EBITDA strong, EBITDA margin strong and growing. Uh, really, really neat. 
All right, so behind me is historical revenue EBITDA for the business. I have converted this into USD based on the average for the year exchange rate for any income or cash flow. And then I've used December average for any balance sheet items uh, to convert what they produce in their 10K being Australian dollars into USD for easier for, for analysis on, on my end. And what you can see is a very strong track record of revenue growth. 2011, $22 million, very, very small, have grown it uh, to $137 million over this time frame. And that's an annual 43% annualized growth rate. So still definitely a small cap company here. This is not a big, big stock by any means. And it's part of their series of small cap stock that we're going to do. But from $22 million to $337 million is strong growth in a growing market. And that's one of the hallmarks that we're going to look for. The next thing we want to do is make sure that this company is profitable and making money. And yes, in fact, they make money every single year while pulling off substantial growth. That's amazing. Um, $3 million to $70 million of EBITDA over, the, over this uh, nine year period of time, which is a 48% growth rate. So you got 43% on the revenue, 48% on the EBITDA. That means margin creep slightly as they gain scale. Fantastic to see. Let's take a look at enterprise value. Enterprise value, like we always do, we start with debt. Debt's the very first thing we look at. And you'll see right here, short-term and long-term debt, almost nothing. has grown a little bit as they made an acquisition recently, $16 million. Excess cash, because they're growing so fast, I'm not giving them any, I'm not, I'm not adding back any excess cash. They have over 130, roughly million Australian dollars on the balance sheet as of, I think, mid-2020. Uh, but I'm not going to add any of that back because they need the cash to grow. So I'll leave it there. So debt plus market cap. They only started trading, uh, at least in the U.S. that I could find, a couple years ago. So they're relatively brand new. And their uh, three years of history is relatively small. Market cap, $2.3 billion of a market cap. Tiny, tiny stock. In, in the grand scheme of things. Enterprise value, enterprise value, right? Adding adding debt plus market cap, less any, less any excess cash gives me enterprise value, the entire business. And it's $2.3 billion. And it's trading at a range of 30 to 45 times EBITDA. That is the payback multiple that you can assign. A, a, a rich multiple for sure in terms of some of the, the, the range that we've seen in, in the financial markets. But for a company growing top line and bottom line revenue at 40 some odd percent annually, that, I think that's actually a fair price to pay for the stock. Debt, aside from this particular year, I think it's an anomaly for them going public. Uh, but their debt is almost almost zero. So definitely checks the box there. Let's move on to free cash flow. Take a look at what free cash flow looks like. All right, let's go through the cash flow statement from App and Libid and figure out does it line up with revenue and EBITDA, what the story is. All right, here is 2011 to 2019 cash flow from operations, CFO, the top third of the cash flow statement, $2 million, relatively small, all the way to $47 million over this time frame. That's a 47% annualized growth rate. That growth rate in cash flow from operations lines up almost exactly with the 48% of EBITDA growth that rate that we saw. That means that the business, the accounting department, is reflecting cash costs on the P&L properly. It means that the accounting department is doing a solid job representing the operating income and the cash flow at the same time, which is what we want to see. Also, what I love to see in software companies is CapEx is almost nothing. Because they don't have to build the machines, they don't have the factories, they have, they're a software company. And most of their service providers are outsourced. They're not, they don't have to build um, big buildings to house all the people like, say, Apple does with its giant infrastructure in Northern California. This is almost nothing, which means your cash flow from operations passes right through to cash flow to equity. Fantastic to see. Debt payments. There's a little bit of story here. Debt payments, as we saw earlier, uh, or rather the debt itself, is almost zero. And there's a little bit of outflow here, inflow and outflow, 
that resulted from A, going public, right? They borrowed a little bit of money. But B, they made a big acquisition of a company called Figure 8 that they used stock to buy. And I'll go through the cash flow statement for you. But I wanted to point out that this is kind of an anomaly. Long term, I would expect most of this to flow right through here because they don't make big acquisitions every day. They don't go public all the time, obviously. So when we look at cash flow uh, forecasting, I'm going to take 47 minus the 2 for this year, and I'll average it with 35 minus the 2 for that year. I'll average both those years and give that cash flow into the future. But let's take a look at the cash flow statement in their 10K or annual report, and I want to show you what uh, what we're looking at and why the um, why there's such a, a little bit of a change in the cash flow of my operation. Um, uh, and you can see it: acquisition of Figure Eight, 233 million Australian dollars. That's a big capex number. This is what the, this is the big number that caused cash flow from investing section on the cash flow statement to be largely negative. And because this is negative, that means it's an outflow of cash. You need an inflow to pay for that because they only generate $67 million of operating cash flow. So here's cash flow from operations. That's our CFO, that's the top third, 67. But they spent 233 million Australian dollars the same year. Where do they get the money from? That's down here. The bottom third is the financing section. It's how you pay for everything that goes on up above. This section, you've got right there a nice positive number, 295, 292 million Australian dollars. How, what's that from? Issuance from shares, net transaction costs. So what do they do? They took their stock. They sold their stock. They got $292 million US, uh, Australian dollars uh, of money. And they bought app and they bought um, figure eight, excuse me. And they paid two hundred and thirty-three million Australian dollars for it. It also looks like they paid down some debt that may have been assumed in that transaction, or they had debt on the books that they wanted to just get rid of to clean up the balance sheet. And that's the negative that you're seeing uh, right here, kind of the negative positive, a little bit of issuance, a little bit of outflow. So this is a one-time blip associated with the transaction. I would expect in the future for that to go, for the cash flow to go right through the state to the cash flow to, to, to equity. So here we are. Here is shares outstanding. You can see the growth rate here from 107 to 121 uh, million shares. That issuance produced the dollars that they got to be able to buy the acquisition that we just went through. Here is the cash flow per share. And it's low here, very, very low, because what we said earlier, the down, the, the uh, pay down of debt. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to average a higher number. I'm going to pretend this goes away. This is going to go up closer to the 57 cents, and we'll use that to forecast forward. All right, let's forecast the EBITDA and figure out what we think this business will generate in EBITDA and free cash flow in 10 years. So how do we do that? We're sitting with a 2019 uh, annual report, we need a 2020 EBITDA number. I have a 2020 number here of 75 million US dollars. How did I get that? Well, one secret I want to give to you guys is the investor relations department at companies, especially small companies like AppN Limited, but it works with Facebook as well. You can email them. It's on their website under the investor relations section on any company's website. You should be able to contact the investor relations department and ask them questions. Certainly with so much going on, so much, so many press releases, annual statements, quarterly statements, uh, sometimes it's, you get lost in the noise and pinging them with an email and say, hey, do you have any guidance for 2020? Can be a fast way to get a number. And I was surprised how responsive App Limited IR department was. I emailed them and got a response back from Linda the very same day with guidance, which was amazing. Thank you, Linda. So what she said is she said, hey, we've already released this statement. Here you go. December 10th, 2020, they gave guidance on a full year 2020 number, and it's right here. We now expect full year 2020 e underlying EBITDA, including the impact of a stronger Australian dollar, to be in the range of 106 million to 109 million. That's a tight range. This is Australian dollars here. The reason they give a comment on the stronger Australian dollar is most of their com com uh, customers are in California, the big tech. So the California companies in the U.S. 
are paying these guys in U.S. dollars. Well, a stronger Australian dollar means when they translate the California, the U.S. dollar revenue into Australian dollars, it's fewer Australian dollars because of the strength of the Australian dollar. So they're kind of cautioning you that there's a little bit of guidance there. Also, the, in, in some of the documentation, they do say that there has been a reduced spending in the AI department by some of those uh, customers because COVID has shut down largely California. Uh, and so as a result, some of these industries have slowed some of their spending, which is calming or tampering down the 2020 earnings for this company. So you're talking like mid single digit growth rate year over year. But I wanted to show you as a, as a, as a resource, you can email the investor relations department of these companies and they will get a response for you. That's, that's their job. Most of the shareholders nowadays, it's all indexed money. And indexed managers never email the investor relations department. They just go with management guidance and that's it. So use these people. That, that's a resource that um, if you're looking for uh, top line revenue, EBITDA, sometimes they give guidance, sometimes they don't. If you can't find a report, email them. They, they will most likely be able to respond very quickly with exactly what you're looking for. And if you're putting your hard earned money into these companies, I highly suggest you ping them every now and then and get, um, get whatever information you're looking for. All right, back to the forecast. So $75 million is me taking the $108, $106 million Australian dollar 2020 EBITDA number and translating it back to US dollar. So I get a roughly 7% annual growth rate year over year which is marketably below what they have done historically, like I said, because they are saying COVID shutdowns in California have slowed some of the spending on their biggest customers, so that's gonna slow. But long-term, the industry is growing at 28%. This 28 figure is in, in their annual report, it's in the chairman's letter, it's in a lot of their other disclosure, they cite it regularly. It's a nice number. And it's substantially less than what they have been growing with at historically. If we go back to the EBITDA number, you can see their growth rate 30, 60, 45, 20, 57, 32. Very strong, all above industry average. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to use the industry average as a, as a normalized, something they should get back in line with. It'll take them, 2021 will grow, and they'll get back to a higher growth rate uh, in the outer years, approaching the industry average. And then as they scale, growth rate will decline over time, putting me a long-term forecast of $450 million of EBITDA for this company based on uh, basically growing at the industry rate, even though they should be able to beat that. I then assign a 25 multiple to that number, which is also conservative. They're trading right now in the 30 range, 34x, 30 rex. If growth stays above industry average like it has, then this market multiple should stay above industry average. But to be conservative, I want to know um, that this investment can sustain itself at a much more um, industry average level. And then if they outperform that, that's that's extra gravy for, for me. So I'm using a 25 multiple on the $450 million. They have roughly no debt, very little cash. Uh, gives me a, a market cap of $11 billion, goes against the outstanding shares, 121 million shares. I'm not buying back any uh, assumed. Gives me a future price target of $92 a share. All right. Let's take a look at cash flow and forecast cash flow. So like I said before, I'm averaging uh, 2018 and 19 without the debt to look at cash flow from operations uh, and against CapEx. I get 34 cents uh, growing that at the 7% rate year over year. I then stretch that out over time, the same growth rate I have for EBITDA because there's no external CapEx that's going out. They're not making any big acquisitions. And I get a $102 price target using a 2% free cash flow yield number for the stock. Okay, now we have two different price targets. We're going to average the two. I've got one price target from the free cash flow to equity method, 102. I've got another one, an EBITDA market multiple method of 92. I'll average the two, puts me close to 100 bucks. $97 long-term price target. Here's where it gets fun. 
It's currently trading the stock in the States around $20 a share. I get a long-term stream of cash flows. They do pay a dividend, but this is the entire uh, free cash flow, and I'm out at $97. What this does when I add it together it produces a stream of cash flows that I can discount back and put an IRR onto. And that IRR is 22%. That means if this holds true, that's a 22% annualized ro uh, rate of return that I'm earning on my investment over this 10 year period of time, which is extremely strong. It also means it's about a five and a half times cash on cash return if I buy and hold the stock, which is amazing. Lastly, they've got some conservatives. I have some conservative assumptions in here, I think, with regard to the growth rate being 28%, substantially less than they have been growing, and the enterprise value multiple at 25 times when they're trading at 34. I've gives room there for it to come down. But a very interesting stock. If I were to put it across the distribution chain so you can see a little bit of a variance, it's at $20 right now, that's a 22% IRR. Should the stock rise, I still think it's worth a buy. If it falls, it becomes even more attractive. So for me, it's definitely a good rating on the stock. Right, let's review and, and see what boxes we checked. Top line revenue growth, yes, very strong. EBITDA growth, yes, growing fast. Strong free cash flow, absolutely, with that low capex, it's very strong. Uh, low debt, yeah, there's almost no debt, and a well-priced stock, yes, it is. It's producing a very strong return, even though it's trading at plus 30%, plus 30 times enterprise value. Its growth rate deserves that kind of multiple. All right, this has been App N Limited. I hope you liked the review. My name is Cameron Stewart, CFA. Give me some comments. Let me know what stocks you'd like to see next. Uh, have a great day, and thanks for watching. Bye-bye.